So today, um, I will be talking, as you can see, on the drilling of Norwich um, soteriology. And um, this research actually came um, into, basically, we can, we can say, I became quite aware, at least more aware, of um, Julian's um, writings and, and works, particularly during the, the COVID pandemic. And during that time, people have tried to find, to find some kind of a comfort in the writings. And so because of also the context in which um, the basically what we're going to look at was based on. And so um, people try to f understand um, what suffering is and even the meaning in suffering. And so that became, I think, quite, um, that opened my eyes more in, in terms of um, the writings of Julian of Norwich. And I hope um, that we would be able to at least find something meaningful um, today. Um, so basically, I just wanted to go to the next slide. So ba the big question um, that I want to bring before we start delving into um, the book, into the work itself, is the question of the, um, the connection of theology and the meaning of theology. And so the two questions here of does suffering influence theology or does theology find meaning in suffering? The first uh, question of um, of does suffering influence theology? I think we have seen throughout um, history how uh, when we have people who have are going through difficulties have somehow managed to formulate a certain type of theology. And we can even look, for example, of liberation theology. Um, that's one of the examples. Or is it that theology in itself is formulated simply through um, the desire and the pursuit of truth? And then only when there's suffering um, can we then have a deeper appreciation and understanding of theology itself. So these two questions, we'll come back to it. Um, much later, but I just want to bring these questions to you uh, for you to kind of like to stew it um, in your mind. So what I'm going to start off with also is just to give a simple background of who Julian of Norwich is. Um, now, Julian um, herself, um, there is little that we know <laughs> about her. Uh, it's simply because even the name Julian is it's believed not to be her real name. Um, the name itself is attached to her because she became what we call an anchoress um, in the 14th century in England in a church called of St. Julian, the church of St. Julian in a town of Norwich. But there's absolutely little that we know of her uh, we do not know her real name. We do not know exactly whether she had a family or anything before that. So it's little that we know of her, except for her connection with the work that she um, that she wrote. But she lived during what we call the bubonic plague, and that is, of course, another word for that. It would be the Black Plague, which totally devastated and killed what what's estimated to be almost half of um, Europe, of Western Europe during that time. So she lived during that time. She saw the um, the suffering and, and and death, and even her herself, she almost experienced. Um, death, which we will come to it later. But during that time, she wrote a book called The Revelation of Divine Love. This is quite ex uh, exceptional because it is believed to be the first um, work that is written in the English language. Uh, and, and the fact that it was um, 
actually written by a woman became such a huge thing. And even it predates um, the King James Version, uh, the King, King James Bible, um, which it's, I think it's sort of believed that the King James Bible uh, Bible became one of the key works that kind of almost standardized the English language uh, during that time. But her work predates that um, over close to a hundred years, uh, which makes it quite exceptional. But also, uh, I think this sort of a disclaimer uh, to keep in mind is that um, Julian lived during the time pre-Reformation, which means that the main form of um, of Christian theology and uh, uh, was based on um, Roman Catholic um, theology. So that is something to keep in mind because quite you know it's quite e it's quite easy for us uh, as Protestants to kind of like to throw away some of the works um, that predates uh, the Reformation. But there's a reason why I brought this here so that we, we should not be afraid to engage with such works, um, but even to properly critique them. So this is just a quick disclaimer um, for that. So the, the basic structure of the revelation of the divine love is that um, it is uh, based on the 16 visions or, the, or what we call the 16 showings that Julian experienced. And it is also divided into what we call 86 chapters. And those chapters themselves are not lengthy chapters. Uh, they can be even to equivalent of one A4 size page for a chapter itself. So it is not a, a very big book, um, so, so to speak. But also it's very important to note that uh, because they are based on the 16 revelations, there's a, a lot of the chapters are not chronological or, or we can even say they're selectively coherent in the sense that some chapters, perhaps three, two or three chapters will be coherent, but then there's always a shift and a change in the, um, in the following chapters. So it is quite difficult to really come up with a proper, I can say, a, a, a theological um, connection from beginning to end, because that is not how it is um, designed. It's actually just so scattered. And because it is selectively coherent, so many people tend to find specific things for themselves and um, which makes it quite difficult, but at the same time, quite intriguing. And I think if you really like the challenge, this is definitely the work to really engage in. Now, for so let's begin with how everything began. So at the beginning of the, of the book itself, Julian ex explains how it all started. So for her, she had this passion of understanding um, Christ's suffering. And we, you know, it's believed that because of the suffering that she saw, uh, and ex even for her to experience, she wanted to find meaning and to understand what suffering really is. But for her, it's also a, a deep reflection uh, and, and also it's more devotional to try to understand uh, the suffering that Christ experienced during the Passion. And um, so it begins with her prayer to really try to understand this. And for her, at least the next point is that for her to want, she wanted to experience sickness almost to the point of death. Um, in her youth, based, so that she could really appreciate um, what Christ did on the cross for her. And also she prayed for what she calls for the three wounds. And these three wounds are based on the type of wounds that Christ experienced on the cross. 
um, the wounds on the hands, the uh, wounds on his feet, and also the wound on the side from the spear. She found those three different types of, um, of wounds to be quite symbolic and quite meaningful. And these wounds, for her, they are, you can say, the wounds of kindness. And the second, the wounds of compassion. And third, the wounds of steadfastness. The, the wounds of kindness and, and compassion, steadfastness, the fact that they are wounds, for her is the concept that they are there permanently. They, she wanted them to be part of her throughout her life, throughout her um, natural life as a Christian. Um, so that they're not simply things that are theoretical, but they become part of her um, spiritual walk and part of her spiritual DNA, so to speak. Um, so kindness and compassion, obviously, these are towards um, people. And steadfastness, this is related to her faithfulness to God for her to be able to walk um, with integrity and to live with integrity um, throughout her life as a, as a Christian. And that's one of the key things for her to, um, when she decided to be an anchoress, it's because an anchoress are people who, I guess uh, women who totally give themselves to the devotion of God. So normally they will go into seclusion, uh, whether it be in the room, uh, one room in a church or the monastery, and some even go to the extreme cases of, um, let's just say, of living the rest of the natural lives, even in the underground crypts, um, so that their primary focus is simply to focus on God, to reflect on the goodness of God um, throughout their lives. Julian um, stayed in a church, as I said earlier, of um, the church of St. Julian in the, in the town called Norwich. And so she had a room um, quite adjacent to the actual chapel so she could listen to um, the sermons every day. She had someone who would come and deliver food to her uh, but outside of that, um, she wanted to focus and to contemplate um, on her relationship with God. So there's so much, I don't want to spend too much on this, but I just want to give you such a, uh, just a, a broad picture um, on who she was and the, the biggest passion um, that she had before writing the revelations of the divine love. So I think the biggest question we're dealing with in concept of soteriology is what was Julian's view on sin? And so be sin, and then second, we will look at um, her, the focus on the passion and also the issue of the eternal judgment. Um, so I'm just going to quote in because, as I stated, this. Her work is quite scattered. And so um, in chapter 20, um, she writes and says, um, and for every man's sin that shall be saved, he suffered. And every man's sorrow and desolation he saw and sorrowed for blindness and love. And I think the, the first and foremost is that she recognized that sin is part of the human problem in the sense that much of the suffering, much of what is happening in the world, sin plays a huge part. And so if anything, her view connects with at least the theology then of the Catholic Church of what, um, so of, of you know, the origins of human sin. So that, in a sense, she she is very faithful to it. And also, in chapter 13, when he talks about, when he says, um, the enemy or the fiend 
uh, being defeated by the passion of Christ. Um, it talks about how the devil himself has been conquered because of the sacrifice that Christ did on the cross. And of course, we can see this um, in Revelation um, chapter 12, verse 11. So the first thing is, yes, she does recognize sin exists. And yes, she does recognize that sin is a problem here in this world. And but that sin itself was defeated by Christ on the cross because of his passion. Um, but also, um, this is also a big question about the concept of suffering and sin, because as I stated that when she had to really um, reflect on the reality of sin and the reality of suffering, um, she wanted to really understand. And so um, chapter 27 as he says, this is, it says, but Jesus who in this vision informed me that all that is needful to me answered by this word and said, it beloved that there should be sin, but all shall be well and all shall be well and all men of things shall be well. And this, this line is one of the biggest lines that I think many people tried to really connect to during the COVID um, um, pandemic, because when people have to reflect and face the reality of suffering and they try to find the answer and the comforting words were simply this of, well, no matter what, everything shall be well. Now, I think for me personally, when I was reading this, um, as an academic, I felt a bit frustration <laughs> because uh, it, it, for me, it, it felt like, um, kind of like a, like a Bob Marley type <laughs> response of, don't worry about anything because every little thing is going to be all right type response. Because even for us as academics, we try to understand, okay, what is the suffering? What is the meaning of suffering? And, but yes, we know that everything will be well, but at the same time, it's quite, I think it's, it is true, but from intellectual perspective, it is highly unsatisfying and highly frustrating. Cause like, yes, we know everything will be well. Yes, we know, but, we still want to get those answers. We still want to get um, those uh, to first to understand the meaning of it all, the meaning of suffering, and it's and even now we're still aren't able to properly and to come up with a satisfactory answer. Besides, everything will be well. So. That's the concept of sin itself. So first sin exists and, and the suffering because of, because of sin is a reality. And it is even difficult for us to come up with a proper answer, or proper understanding on the meaning of suffering itself. Only just, a cons just a, the, the realization and the truth that at the end of everything, God is the one who will make everything well, according to his purpose. But the next part we wanna focus here is the concept of the passion and the judgment. Um, and this is quite important because a lot of Julian's writing focuses on the passion and the meaning of the passion. And it seems to have kind of like this singular tunnel vision of just focusing so much on the passion and a little bit on anything else. Because even with, with sin itself, it's there, but it is not a huge part. 
So the focus is all is on the passion itself. And that's why even when you when you look at the initial plea, which is recorded in chapter two, of her prayer to experience the suffering, that is her starting point. And that is her primary focus. And there are so many references. I just only mentioned um, just chapter 17 to 20 on the suffering of Christ is, um, himself, but there's numerous, there's so many um, references just focusing on the passion itself. Um, but also in connecting to the suffering, there's also um, the extreme loss of blood. I think there's a lot, um, I would say a, a very interesting um interest in blood and the loss of blood and Christ's blood. And quite often she, um, she makes a huge contrast of the amount of blood being lost uh, versus the fairness and the beauty of Christ um, himself. And so that becomes, so, but the whole thing of suffering versus beauty becomes a huge, um, display of this or two contrast at the passion um and um but above everything else love becomes the main motivation of why christ was willing to go through what he did and love becomes that um that one umbrella that ties everything together Suffering played a huge role. Pain played a, a huge role. And all of this simply because love is the one thing that really motivated Christ to do what he did, to experience suffering the way he did. And that is why even for Julian, that passion um, that she wants to experience because for her to experience that level of suffering to a point of her death um, is simply because of what she perceived to be her love for Christ because Christ loved her to that extent. Now, also one thing that is quite um, interesting is also what, what what at least what I perceive to be sort of the mystical nature of the blood uh, of Christ. And as I stated like in the chapter in chapter 12, there was a focus on the blood and the amount of blood being lost. And even in chapter 12, what she talks about is envisioning how that amount of blood that Christ experienced on the cross that is oozing from his hands and his feet and his body, all that amount. Because even the language she uses and the description, it is not merely about few droplets of blood that slowly accumulates you can sort of imagine blood flowing in a, as, as in like a gushes from the body of Christ. And that amount of blood then sips deep down into the earth and reaches hell itself. And that blood then be, breaks the chains of those um, who are bound, who would enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so that is sort of that imagery that, um, that, that she, um, she presents in the writing. Uh, so with the language connected to that, I think a lot of questions have come up with whether or not uh, Julian believes in what we call a universal salvation. That means uh, that she believes that everyone, everyone, um, every single human being will be saved no matter what. 
and people like um, like Sweetman actually believes that actually um, that Julian was a universalist and believed that everyone, all human beings, will go to heaven. And the focus was actually based on the. Um, let me go back to to that view of in chapter um, 27 where in that vision God said um, and all everything all manner of things shall be well so they their interpretation is that because God will make everything well so therefore um, all sin all suffering including those in hell will end and will and everyone, all human beings, will be restored into heaven, and there'll be no one um, in hell. So that is how uh, Sweetney, uh, Sweetman, and many others who believe that Julian is a universalist actually uh, points to. But they also focus on the wrong thing because um, I think also, for example. Um, one of the um, sort of defense for universalism was that um, for that amount of blood will sifting down into um, the earth and right into hell, that amount of blood then broke the chains of everyone in hell and therefore everyone then went into heaven. But I don't think so. And for me personally, I, I do not believe so because even the language itself that Julian talks about, it says um, for those who belongs to, because say the court of heaven. So she makes that distinction between those who belong to the court of heaven and those who do not. And those who belong to the court of heaven, they are the ones who then were restored or uh, taken to heaven while the others did not. So, and I, I, I will make another case um, on this as well, uh, because when we look at chapter 52, um, it's let's look at it. It says, uh, for all mankind that shall be saved by the sweet incarnation and the blissful passion of Christ all is the manhood of Christ, for he is the head and we are his members, to which members the day and of the time is unknown when every passing woe and sorrow shall have an end and the everlasting joy and bliss shall be fulfilled, which day and time for um, to see all the company of heaven longeth and all that shall be under the heaven that shall come hither their way is by longing and desire. So kind of like to break this down. The first will be, it talks about for all mankind that shall be saved. So you have the concept of mankind and the separation of uh, that shall be saved. So the mankind obviously is not just matter of every soul, but we can talk about all peoples, which meaning all we talk about every nation, every tongue, every every tribe, and again the separation of that shall be saved because you have those that will be saved, but at the same time you have those that will not. And depending, so I'm not going to go into the um, the debate of between um, we can say Calvinism or, or, or Arminianism, but the separation of whether uh, people, those who that will be saved versus those who will not, it is evident there. But also at the bottom there, when it says, and all that shall be under heaven and shall come hither, their way is by longing and desire. Because it shows that those that, that shall be saved, it is because of the longing and the desire to do so. And the reality is that there are those who will not, who, I guess, who do not have that longing and desire to be saved. Um, there are those who actually exist. Uh, one basic example will be um, 
someone like this, the late Christopher Hitchens, um, who at least who was the um, a very strong and adamant um, atheist, and he himself even in many well, I think one of his interviews we can on YouTube he's saying that um, he will not even um, believe in Christ. Um, no matter what, and if somehow because of um, towards the end of his life, if he believes that if he utters the words that signifies some kind of faith is simply because of mere delusion, uh, but it's not because of something that is from the heart. So you have someone like that who absolutely has no longing and desire. But yes, we know that even at the end, of death, there's no, we do not know of what happens. However, I think even the scriptures themselves do point between those that shall be saved and those that will not. And the and the phrase that that shall, um, that shall be saved is quite evident it's in so many places, in so so many places. Um, for example, even chapter fifty three, you have the difference of of the soul that the souls that shall be saved and um and many other chapters um like this that points to people that shall be saved and those that um shall not be saved so in a nutshell for my personal view i do not believe that um julian was a universalist at all uh, i think Many people, there's those that believe they're very selective and totally ignores the language that is evident in much of her writing. And also, I think the very fact that it ignores that even um, uh, Julian herself, because of her own um, can say devotion to God and adherence to at least the church doctrine, she maintains that, she maintains that view. And this is actually quite evident in chapter 33, um, where, uh, where she says, um, and yet in this I desire as far as I does that I might have full sight of hell and purgatory. Like, like I said, keep in mind that this is the Catholic Church um, theology. But it was not my meaning to make proof of anything that belongs to the faith. For I believe uh, soothfastly that hell and purgatory is for the same end that um, Holy Church teaches. That my meaning was that I might have seen for learning in all things that belong to my faith, whereby I might live um, the more to God's worship and to my prophet. Basically saying that for her, even in, in, what, in, the, in the visions, she wanted to understand more about how hell is like. And I, even with her Catholic background of what purgatory might be like. So, and because that is what a, the church teaches and for her, it is simply to understand more of what that what that means, but obviously um, for because of even though she desired to know this and the, although she adhered to this, um, according to her words, God didn't show her anything about hell or whatever, but simply that even repeating the whole thing of all men and things shall be well that she basically she didn't need to know about this but the focus was just simply based on her initial prayer of understanding the passion understanding the suffering of christ and understanding everything that jesus did um for us um so basic summary because i want us to kind of move on uh basic summary is that first of all with the biblical view of sin Julian adhered to the, um, the, at least the, the theology of the day that sin exists and suffering through sin is a reality. But also she looked at the passion itself. 
um, the importance of the passion. And third, um, she um, she adhered to the um, the you can say the the Catholic view of the existence of hell and the reality that those who um, uh, some will be saved and some may not be saved. But there's also the kind of like the narrow tunnel vision um, that I think um, for, based on her initial desire to understand the passion that a lot of focus is actually on that um, as well. Now, just gonna move on. Now, con going back to the, uh, the question of does suffering influence a theology or does theology find meaning in suffering? Um, I think we have seen how, uh, particularly with uh, Julian, is that um, she took the already existing theology and she wanted to understand that more where suffering actually brought meaning um, to, to theology. But at the same time, I think even during the process of the viewing and the, and the vision that she saw, um, she also then began to develop um, sort of a, 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 a different type of theology, particularly surrounding um, the concept of blood, the theology of blood, the power that the blood of Christ may have. Um, so it's, it's a mix and match of these two um, with uh, Julian. Um, but I think there's something that also we need to keep in mind of the way we approach theology, because even within our different theological backgrounds, we there is already um, a canon of theology that we adhere to, but sometimes it takes suffering for us to appreciate that. Um, but at the same time, even throughout the process, because of suffering, we also begin to develop our own theologies because of trying to find meaning um, um, because of the suffering that we are experiencing. So special consideration, particularly in the global south, and I'll, I'll finish off um, with this. Um, and it says, especially in the global south, um, when we deal with the global south, of course, the global south is very rich, is extremely rich with different types of um, Christian uh, traditions. And one of the key things that I think the global south has is that there is a lot of syncretism between the local traditional views and and Christianity. And even in, in South Africa, for example, when we look at the African indigenous churches or, or African initiated churches, we see that hybrid and that mixing in there. And so one of the things I will say that in particular for us is the necessity for personal reflection and devotion in theology. Um, I think one thing that one of the good things and positive things to take from Julian's theology and writing is that she had a huge desire to know and understand more about Christ, to understand more about the suffering of Christ, to understand and appreciate what Christ did. So I think that connection between theology and personal devotion is quite essential for anyone, whether it be, uh, you can say, theological um, professors, students, pastors, that it should not just merely be theoretical, but we should actually step deeper within us so that it finds meaning with our own spiritual growth. Um, but also the second is that we need to recognize the limitation of the singular focus approach to theology. Because Julian's focus was primarily on the passion and the suffering of Christ, then everything else began to diminish. For example, the necessity of Christ 
full obedience and living a perfect life. The, um, the importance and the necessity of the resurrection, for example, um, that is not necessarily dealt with. But because the focus was primarily on one thing, everything that are equally important began to diminish. And I think even with how we preach um, salvation and how we preach um, this, uh, the, the passion, quite often we'll find that if we focus again on the cross, we find uh, on the suffering and not necessarily appreciating the full package of full of perfect obedience, perfect um, spotless lamb to, and the necessity of the resurrection and the ascension in one full complete package, then it does not necessarily create a proper picture of what um, Christ's work did for us on the cross. And the second, of course, we'll talk about the mystification of the blood of Christ or the, the theology behind of Christ, which I think uh, we've seen this. Um, what did you call it? Um, yeah, we've seen this in so many in, in, uh, church tr tr um, traditions on um, um, Christians who have who ascribes the power of the, or, or, or can say, or the um, the properties of blood of Christ that are not um, can say um, explained or dealt with within the scriptures. And we've seen how people, for example, would pray and plead the blood of Jesus over things in their lives um, without having a proper biblical um, foundations for it. And that is pretty much the same thing of ascribing certain properties to the blood of Christ that is outside what the scriptures teach. So that is just something that I think we need to be mindful of, that for us, we, it is about what the scriptures teach and how do we, what is the proper way of teaching about the, um, the sacrifice of Christ and even the blood of Christ um, and not and ascribing certain properties that are outside of scriptures, but may sound good and also may sound good in popular cultures and may sound good even on what is being preached on, 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 through the television and things like that. But it's about what scripture says about the sacrifice of Christ that is quite essential. All right, and I think um, I will finish off here. And then uh, if there are any questions, then I will um, be happy to answer them. Thank you.